Hello and welcome to Generation 2020. I hope you are all having a great time and with us. And in this session, we will have Nicholas Frankel presenting It's Easy, an experiment in continuous deployment of GVM applications. Hello, Nicholas. Are you fine? Everything fine with you? Hi. Thanks for having me here. Uh, thanks for the introduction. And thanks, everybody, um, to be attending this session. Okay, cool. Are you ready to rock this session? All right. Sorry, so, I didn't understand. Without further delays, I'm going to uh, hand it over to you. Uh, good luck, mate. Have Thank nice you. Session. Uh, thanks, everybody, to be here uh, for this session about continuous deployment of GVM applications. Um, I'm Nicola Frankel. I've been doing technical stuff for like nearly two decades, um, uh, being a developer, an architect, a team lead, whatever. Um, one year and a half ago, I decided to do developer advocacy because I, I had already started to talk. And the good thing with developer advocacy is you, you, you can have a lot of ideas that they, they don't necessarily need to work or not. But and then I had this like crazy idea or I, I would prefer to say creative that I mean, how can we try to do continuous delivery of, of byte code in production? Uh, I work for a company called Hazelcast and perhaps you, you might know about Hazelcast. Um, we have two products. One of them is an in-memory data grid. So basically, to like, be very, very short, it's like uh, data structures that are distributed on the network. So you have a simple API. It, for example, it looks like a map, but the data is all over the network in uh, every node. They, they are sharded. And um, the second product that we have is called Hazelcast Jet. And because I will be using it uh, later in the talk, then uh, I won't talk about it further right now. So probably uh, you are already familiar with continuous integration. The fact that uh, every time uh, a developer um, pushes, then uh, the server, the continuous integration server, or no, there are GitHub actions, it's serverless anyway, but they, they do some specific tasks, such as uh, compilation, unit testing, packaging. If, if you want to go further, of course, you can do integration testing on a new package. And if you are uh, like one of those hype guy or, or girls, then you are doing containerization. And then this container should be stored in the registry, but the package can also be stored in the registry. So this is everything that, um, in general, you do when you just push whether it's on master or not. But um, th this actually is just what everybody should do, depending on the exact tasks. But every company, I expect that uh, they do it. Uh, however, um, <clears throat> there is a recent trend that I dislike a lot, saying CI, CD, and they conflate both terms. Like <clears throat> CI and CD are completely the same, which I, I push back against. Because if continuous integration is the norm, then you have continuous delivery. And I don't know many companies that do continuous delivery because uh, while continuous integration in the end is having the package in the registry, uh, continuous delivery is having the package in production ready ready at the push of a button to serve. And <clears throat> as I mentioned, it, it's much harder and there are not many companies that do it. And if you, if, you, if you go to be completely fully automated, then that's called continuous deployment. And of course, if you do continuous deployment, you have no downtime. And only a few companies are able to do that. Actually, yeah, the big ones like Google or Facebook or, or Netflix, they, they do it. But like traditional customers, our traditional employers, they, they, don't, they don't do that. They, they stop at continuous integration and, and it's all. And if you work in the Java world, it's understandable because as I mentioned, continued deployment um, in the GVM is quite hard. Like the usual way to deploy a, a, new, a new package, whether it's a jar or the war, is to stop the GVM. 
then to copy paste, so to overwrite the old package, and then to start the GVM again. And of course, if you stop the GVM, that means that you cannot serve the services down. And so you have this traditional, if it's a website, yeah, you have this traditional, hey, sorry, come back in, in a few minutes, we are upgrading. And in this day and age, a lot and lot of businesses or people, they, they don't want that. Um, there might be some reasons for that. One of the reasons is first, like engineers want to do cool stuff. We want to have no downtime. We want to show that we can do without any downtime. And if you are proposed a job where you have the traditional way of deploying, like stopping the service, that is a static web page, or a, 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 a new way, a hype way, a more modern way, you will probably choose the newer job. So that the companies, they are aware of that. They are trying to attract those brand of engineers. The second reason is, um, well, users, not developers, but traditional users, um, if they use Facebook, if they use Gmail, if they use Netflix, they, they, they are never shown any, any downtime static page. They just are used that the service is always up. So it, 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 it um, brings the expectation on a higher level so that if you are not doing it, if you are still having downtime, then it, you, you look a bit bad. And the third reason is if you are in e-commerce, for example, if you have your site down for any uh, length of time, then it's during this time you don't sell and people, they are buying elsewhere and you don't want that. So it, it's, it directly impacts your revenue and, and business hates it. So, so the, the question is, how can we do deployment without any downtime? Well, you, you might already know about this blue-green deployment stuff. So you have two, two environments. They are the same. And one of them is just like as a generic label called green, the other blue, and then, then you, you, you are using the green one as production. And when you want to deploy a new version, then you deploy the new version on the blue environment. And with a switch of a button, then you move the arrow from the green environment to the blue environment, and you have deployed your, your application. And of course, there are a lot of issues regarding that, uh, like, what about the users that are still on the green environment? I mean, they were putting stuff on their cart and all of a sudden the, the environment, the production environment changed. So what, what should we do about them? Should we uh, redirect them to the, to the blue environment? And, and how, and more importantly, what about their data? Because you, if you have two databases, then we should migrate their data very, very fast, which is near to impossible. So um, a, an option is to have a single database. But that brings other problems because if you have a single database between the blue and the green environment, how do you, do you manage uh, like database schema changes? Um, then it becomes a problem in its own. And of course, like always, Kubernetes is, is there to, to solve all your problem because in Kubernetes, you have this deployment thing and you have rolling updates. So basically you can have like multiple nodes and then you say, oh, I will do the deployment uh, using a rolling update and Kubernetes does it like node by node. The problem is, yes, it's magic if your workload is stateless. Now, if it's stateful, like if you have the database, it hasn't changed anything uh, about the database issue that I mentioned with blue-green deployment. You still either have two databases and you don't know how to migrate from one to the other instantly, or you have one single database. And if there is an, uh, a database uh, schema change, uh, you, you need to, to handle it in a graceful way. And it, it's, it's a problem in its own. Now we are using the GVM. And if I that you could actually change the bytecodes um, inside the running GVM. So you keep the, the GVM running and you just change the bytecode that's running inside it. That, that would feel like magic. Uh, but actually, that's what I will be trying to show you in this uh, talk. So in this talk, I will uh, go through a couple of APIs. So the first is called the Instrumentation API. The second that is necessary for this um, uh, demo to work is the Attach API. Then I will tell you how to bind those two together uh, using streaming. And I will talk a bit more about Hazelcast Jet. And finally, I will show you the demo, how it can work. 
So the first, uh, I, I guess, uh, if you have a bit of familiarity, of a bit of experience with the GVM, you might be already uh, privy to Java agents. Um, if you have, if if you are uh, have been using, um, I don't know, instrumentation um, monitoring, sorry, uh, uh, software. This is done for Java agents. So basically, you have these uh, specific jars with, with specific metadata and a specific, like specific main main methods, and basically they allow you to change the bytecode of running your application. And when you do such an agent, it's part of the instrumentation API. So you have two types of agents. The first is a static agent, and in general, it's the one that people know about because uh, if you have if you have uh, been using monitoring agents, it's exactly what you do. You set it at startup time. So, sorry, instead of doing Java dash jar my jar, you add this dash Java agent and the pass to the agent jar, and that's in general what people do. And you don't need to know exactly what this does. In general, it intercepts the calls to any methods put it in the log somewhere, and then you have um, an, 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 a third party software that is able to read the output of these agents and show you nice graph and, and dashboards and whatever. What, what not that many people know is that there is another way uh, to uh, attach an agent and it's um, dynamically. So basically you have a GVM that is running not in debug mode, that is really running in normal mode, nothing specific. And then you are able through something called the attach API, and I will show uh, it to you a bit later, that you, you can inject an agent, you can attach an agent to this first running GVM. Two kinds of agents. So you have two different methods. So for a standard jar, you have an entry point, public, static, void, main. Here, it's a bit different. It's called either pre-main or agent main. And more importantly, there is this instrumentation interface that is paced to you by the GVM. So you can get a handle on it, and then you can store it for later usage. And likewise, in the traditional jar, you have this main class here. You can have a pre-main class or an agent class. And of course, nothing prevents you, uh, nothing prevents a jar from being both static and dynamic. So you can use it in both use cases. What is instrumentation good for? Well, you can change the class implementation. So that's the first problem that we had is how can we change the class implementation? Well, we can change it using this instrumentation. And also, but we won't do it, you can apply automatic transformation of bytecode when the class is loaded. So <clears throat> here is uh, the class diagram. This is what will be passed to you by the GVM as an agent. And the important stuff is here. This is this redefined classes uh, method. And basically, once you have an instrumentation, you can redefine classes passing a var or a class definition. What is a class definition? Well, it's just a simple class and an array of bytes. And actually, the array of bytes is the bytecode itself. So once you have the class and you have the new bytecode, you can create a class definition, pass the class definition to this redefined classes method, and presto, you have changed the running bytecode. You can see also it's possible to use it. Um, it. It's module friendly in a way. I never use it with module, but actually you, you can do that with modules also. Second point, the attach API. So when you have a static agent, when you have a dynamic agent, you must find a way to pass the agent to a running GVM. And this is the goal of the attach API. So you have this GVM running production. It runs your production code. Everything is fine. You run it in normal mode, no debug mode, no open port, no nothing. And then you have this other GVM that will attach the dynamic agent to it. So the second GVM will just run, load the agent, and stops. But there are two requirements. The first requirement is 
both through GVM, they must run on the same operating system. And the second is the second one to attach the, uh, the jar, the dynamic jar, must know the PID of the first one. Bearing that, all bets are off. So you can do anything you want afterwards. So only two requirements. And the attach API is even simpler. So basically, you have this virtual machine <clears throat> attach ID. This is a static method. You just need to, need to pass the PID, as I mentioned, of the production GVM you want to attach to. It returns an instance of virtual machine. And then on this instance, you call the load and you pass the path to the agent plus options if you want. So now we know how to change the bytecode for the instrumentation API. We know how to pass the agent through the attach API. So how can we basically read bytecode changes? There comes the third part, streaming. So one way to move the bytecode around is basically through batching or through streaming. Most people are aware of batching. Batching is, in general, those big ETL jobs that takes data from one place to another place by perhaps doing some transform, ETL standing for extract, transform, and load. But actually, you can batch anything. It's just that when you are doing batching, you move bounded data around. So you move the content of a database or the content of a table or the content of a folder or whatever. So you, you know it's bounded data. So once you, you've gone through all of it, then it's finished. But then you are probably aware of the streaming API in Java 8. And the streaming concept itself is just moving unbounded data. Because in streams, I mean, a stream can be infinite. And the concept of streaming in that case is the same. It might be infinite. So what we want is we want to like receive events. And you might know about some, or let's say some kind of um, in-memory stream processing engines, though there are some running in the cloud, such as Amazon Kinesis or Google PopSub or whatever, or on-premise. Uh, and I need to mention Flink or Hazel Cosjects. A special mention to Apache Beam because it tries to be an abstraction layer over different implementations, which is super cool. Of course, on one side, it's super cool. On the other side, because there is a standard and because this abstraction layer has been designed afterwards, then it's a bit leaky. So it's not as easy as, let's say, changing your, GDBC, uh, your um, database from Oracle to MySQL or otherwise. There is a joke because it's not as easy either. But let's say that the GDBC layer is, is less leaky than this one. Anyway, it's still, I think it's a worthy effort to have this abstraction layer. So Hazel, Hazel Cast Jet is a in memory streaming engine. Uh, it's delivered under uh, Apache 2 open source license. So basically, you can use it however you want. And there are two ways to use it either it's through embedded mode. So basically, your application will say, oh, I will use the library. So you will embed it as a jar. It will be part of your dependency. And then you have one node, because it's distrib distributed system, per instance of your application. The issue with that is that if you need to scale, because you need more JET nodes to handle the load, then you will need to create as many nodes as your apps. So that's not that great. You cannot have independent scaling. On the good side, it's very easy to use right off the bat to have fun and to start developing. So you, you've on, your, on your machine, you can just add that to your Maven Palm or to your Gradle build and start hacking right now. The other way is to use the server client API. And so there is independent scaling. So basically, you will always, your application will be a client of a server. Hazel Gadget tries to bridge the batch and the streaming API so that basically, if you want to go from batching because you are uh, used to it, to streaming is just one line of code that you need to add. And this is uh, like an overview of the ecosystem. 
So it's also what, as I mentioned, it's also an ETL, but it, it uses uh, unbounded data sets. Um, so you can extract for any, from any of those sources, Kafka, like any IoT device, of course, IMDG, a file system, a socket, or if you are aware of change data capture, you can also read your database events. And of course, if something is not here, you can create your own. So you have an API to create your own way to, to read it. And then, of course, on the opposite side, you have all the same plus different alerts or whatever. Again, you can have custom stuff if, if it's not there. And meanwhile, you can do everything that you would do with ETL. The only difference is that it's distributed. So that's the really cool stuff is basically <laughs> When you are doing ETL with traditional ways, you are reading from one database, for example, putting into another database, you need to put that on, uh, you need to read from master and you need to put it somewhere also on master. And it's very hard to scale, but Hazelcast Jet, Hazel Jet is distributed all the way. So you can map or filter or whatever all over, not only over one single node and all the processors on this single node, but all over the networks of all nodes. And if you need, then you can probably read your database, put that in memory in Hazelcast IMDG, and then you can enrich it. So if you have reference data, instead of every time you need to read it from the database, which is super expensive, then you load it once into memory, and then you can enrich it, and memory access is very, very fast. So. Now I have all my three ports, and this is what it looks like. So I will have my production GVM that runs my app. And because it's a GVM, then it offers the attached API. Good. Then I will have the jet job that will read changes to my classes, to my source class on my local file system. And every time there is a change, I will directly push it to Hazelcast IMDG. So basically it will be here, it will be a gigantic hash map of classes name and byte code. And finally, I will start the injection GVM that will push the agent jar to the production GVM through the attach API. And what this agent jar will do is it will subscribe to changes here in this Hazelcast MDG stuff. And every time there is a change, it will actually get the new bytecode and change the existing bytecode to the new bytecode. So here is the same diagram in a, a nice sequence uh, diagram. So I have this jet job and it will loop over and read the source class changes. Of course, I don't want to actually uh, send um, the same bytecode over and over because it would be useless. So I will filter out if the bytecode has not changed. And the good thing is because here I am accessing the Azelcast MDG, I can say, hey, if it hasn't changed, if it's not the same, then like push it. If it's the same, do nothing. Then on the second uh, step, I will attach uh, to the production GVM, which will subscribe to the new Hazelcast IMAP. And then when there is an event, then it will read the bytecode and reload the bytecode on the fly. Now it's time for what I hope will be a nice demo. Are there any questions? Well, uh, Nicholas, there is one question uh, regarding the instrumentation API, I guess. Uh, uh, the question is uh, why there are still some packets? Will will they be deprecated? I think you use it some some packets on the on your presentation. I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, well, let's be let's be honest. I, I'm pretty sure I don't understand the question. <laughs> okay, the question was uh, why you are still using some packages. Will What's they some be packages? deprecated? 
Okay, I will get back to the question later and I will stay okay. on the Slack because I, I'm, I'm not understanding the question now. Okay. Okay, um, so here I have this, I will close everything. And here I have a simple, stupid application. So it's a main class that basically uses Tomcat embedded as a new context and adds the servlet and the servlet is here. So I will run it. I, I, I run it normally, not in debug mode. That is very important. And here, amazing, amazing. I can display hello world. How cool is that? Okay, now I will close both of them because I, this, is, this is considered my production code, my production GVM. I don't want to touch it. It sits somewhere over the network. What I want to do is here on my local machine, I have this class, which of course is exactly the same. And when I change this class, I want this class to be read and to actually be Sorry, I need to stream. So the first thing I need to do is to actually launch this pipeline and this pipeline, sorry. This pipeline will actually read from the local file system. So the classes folder in the Maven, it will just print it into the log just to make sure that at least if something is wrong, I will check that it's wrong. And then I will filter it because as I mentioned in my presentation, I don't want uh, if the, 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 the bytecode has not changed to stream it. So I will check the exact existing uh, IMAP if it already contains the bytecodes and if it's the same. And basically, if it's not the same, so it's in Kotlin, but it, it doesn't change a thing. Um, if it's, it's not the same, it will keep it. If it's the same, it will filter it out. And then run it after I will run it afterwards. Then I will the agents. And the agent is just listening. So as I mentioned, the agent, this will be the entry point of the agent. It will have this instrumentation class. This instrumentation class will be passed to this bytecode change listener. And what it does, it subscribe to the correct map, which where I, I will stream the bytecode. And every time there is a change, I will call the redefine classes, creating the class definition with the existing class and the new bytecodes. So this is the agent. I've already created it as a jar. And finally, I will need that using the attach API. This is the GVM that will take the jar and inject it. And as you can see, it's that simple. I will get the main PID because I don't, since the PID will be changing every time, I'm using the process handle to filter out processes that are of type org as well as by constream.main, which basically is my main, uh, my running server from now. So I will run this one. So this is a jet job. So it's streaming, but nothing has changed. And then I will inject the jar. And as you can see, as I mentioned already, the, by, the, the jar has been created. So I pass it on the command line. And here it has injected it. And you, you can see that it has injected it here because here is my production GVM. And you can see that now it's listening to the IMAP, to IMDG. And now, this is the stuff from source. And I will say, hey, hello, J Nation. 
and then we'll compile it. And normally, if everything is good, it works. And of course, you can do whatever you want. Uh, it's HTML, so you can say, every time I do a change, I compile it, and I rerun it, and it still works. And this is this class, source. But this class was the one So I have streamed the changes from my local targets folder to a running GVM in production. Of course, all is running on my machine right now, but I mean, you understand the point. And now there are of course some limitations. Um, one of the limitations, for example, is if you have been using a regular deployment, you are used to tagging. So you create version 1.1 .1 of the application, you, uh, create, you tag it on GitHub, then you create this 1.1 jar, then you remove the 1.0, and you deploy the new one, and you are happy, and you know exactly what version runs in production. If you are doing continuous deployment, um, doesn't work like that because you will you might be i mean the, the the goal is to deploy anytime you want and in general anytime you want is several times per day so it's it's a mindset you must accept that hey what version well you cannot reason in version anymore the second is i am being very lazy so basically i don't create new classes i don't create new classes um i could I could uh, like do uh, some loading of the class, but I've checked the API. It, it's a bit more involved, and uh, well, I didn't do it. The third is is a bit harder. It's actually much much harder because the redefined classes is limited by itself. Uh, you cannot add or remove or rename fields nor methods. You cannot change the um, the hierarchy of uh, of the serial natures of methods. Um, so it, it makes the thing quite limited. Um, however, uh, we can do some, some improvement, of course, because as I mentioned, I am using my machine, which is just good for a demo. But imagine we could do the same at the end of, of a continuous integration pipeline. So instead of reading my local folder, we could be reading a folder that is on the CI server. And every time there is a change on that folder, then the, the, the changes would be streamed as well. So the fact that it's running on my machine or on the, on the pipeline, it's not very interesting. The second is if you are very stressed about having the correct version and you want to know what's running in production to be absolutely sure, well, you can actually take the metadata from git tag or whatever and inject it as well because nothing prevents you from adding additional metadata and if you want to go uh, the, the complete i mean to remove the limitation of the redefined class that you cannot uh, add attributes remove attributes change your method signatures or whatever what you could do is you could implement a custom class loader um, so if you know about string dev tools for example string dev tools if you put it on your string application, then it uses two class loaders. The first class loaders is for libraries, and it never changes, and it's good. Um, and the first one, it's only for your classes. So basically, if it detects a change that's not compatible, then it will scratch this class loader and restart it. And the good thing is since the, the, it won't bring the GVM down, it will keep the libraries already loaded. So the, the restart is very, very fast. So it, it's just for fun. But actually, if you want to go a bit beyond, it's a bit more involved, but it's not impossible. So it's a good prototype for you, um, but of course not ready to use. Uh, so I thank you a lot for your attention. Uh, you can read my weekly blog on uh, blog.frankel.ch. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. It's always nice. And more importantly, if you have 
uh, if you want to do the same, if you want to understand how the, the code is, is done, then you can get uh, it from GitHub. It's public. And of course, if you want to contribute, if you add to add the crazy ideas that I proposed before, um, then you are welcome to send me PR. And now I can have more questions. All right, Nicholas, thank you for your wisdom presentation. I hope you like the demo. Yeah, I especially enjoyed it. Uh, I also think everyone did. Um, well, uh, I have only that question that uh, I posted to you uh, a while ago. I will uh, rephrase it. Um, I think in your presentation, there is a package uh, called com.sun.tools.attach. And uh, people are. Uh, yeah. OK, now I understand. It. Here, yeah. you mean this one? Yeah. Yeah. The attach API right now is for hotspot. So basically, you must use this API. Um, I didn't find uh, any other way to use it, but um, if you check, unless you are using RHEL VM, uh, you probably or perhaps J9, you, prob you, you probably have it. Now, if you are using J9 or uh, a, a, a GVM that doesn't have this package, then you can have the attach API in another package, but it will be a similar API anyway, because oh. it's part of the specification. All right. So. Uh... Guys are also uh, asking if uh, this won't get deprecated somehow in the future. I mean, um, if if your question is is a, <laughs> we are afraid to use unsafe. I mean, yes, unsafe right now is being well has been deprecated already since a long time. Well, I mean, it's even worse. It was never meant to be used, but um, there are ways to use the same features are unsafe using uh, new modern APIs. So I, I don't see any issue. What, what, what's the real issue with that is you must have the attach API open, which basically means you, you must have configured your security manager so that it allows the attach API to work. That means that, I mean, people who are access to the production machine, they are able to change the bytecode the running bytecode. So they could do bad stuff as well. Yeah. So the question, as always, it's not black and white. It's a trade-off is, hey, do you want to do that? Do you want to use this uh, feature to do this super cool stuff? Because here, that means that if you have a bug, for example, and you can say, oh, here, I forgot something, then you can fix it on the spot without any downtime. That's really, really great. Now, on the opposite side, somebody, a hacker who could have access to your system, could say, oh, I will get the bytecode and I will change it to something. I know if you are working in the bank that I will shave off a few cents and send money to my account. So you must be very careful. Um, it, it's a trade-off. You must consider whether it's worth it or not. Uh, if, you, if it's not worth it, you must use the security manager to prevent it. But if you think it's worth it, then it, it's a way to uh, to use streaming. And of course, this, this, this talk is about um, like distributing bytecode. But the, the, the important stuff in this talk is that if you consider everything as an event, you find a lot of use case for streaming, but really, really a lot. Like streaming in general is, say, is just meant to say, oh, we must take data from one place to another place. But bytecode is data, actually. And if you look at things, a lot of things is data. So this streaming way of thinking can you apply to a lot of different domains. Of course, I'm not, I'm not working in a domain anymore. But I, if you're working in e-commerce, if you're working in banks, if you're working, I mean, you probably have a, a very good understanding, a very deep understanding of your domain where streaming can be used for, for like to, to improve stuff. And this is the domain I know. This is like deploying, but probably you can have lots of other use cases that are very relevant. So think about streaming. OK, thank you, Nicholas. Uh, we have uh, no more questions. Uh... I will stay a bit on the Slack channel. So if you are a bit shy or didn't have time to think about it, then I can answer the questions on Slack channel.
Yeah, thank you very much for thanks a lot your presentation and uh, enjoy the conference. Thank you for being with us. Uh, well, and to every attendee, uh, enjoy the break and see you in uh, 20 minutes.